Well, hello everyone. Thank you so much for tuning into my talk uh, this afternoon. I am Racine Ramjel. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a PhD student at the University of California, Irvine, and I'm also a Wrigley Fellow. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about host parasite relationships in marine snails under changing climate conditions. So to get started, we know that across our oceans, we're seeing a rise in seawater temperatures. And so climate models are predicting these increases of average water temperatures of about 1.5 degrees C within the next 30 years. And if we look at this figure here, this is showing you the changes in sea surface temperature um, from 1901 to 2015. And every single black plus sign that you see is a significant increase in sea surface temperature. So we can see across our oceans that we're seeing these rising temperatures. And if we zoom in on a coastline, we also know that there's natural geographic thermal variation that exists. So this is a heat map and it's showing you the water temperature along our California coastline. And if we zoom in, here's Catalina Island right here. So this was a heat map taken about two days ago from NOAA. So we're a little warmer than normal, but it's summer. So we're about, you know, in between 20 and 23 degrees Celsius. And where I do my work is I zoom in even closer and I work on the coastlines, whether it be an island or on the mainland. And so I work within the intertidal zone. So here's a general schematic of what a rocky shore uh, tide zone looks like. And I work in this area right here. So this is the area that when the tide is out, it's exposed to air, there's little tide pools that form, and the animals that live in there are things like hermit crabs, mussels, anemones, barnacles. And for this talk, I'm gonna be focusing in on periwinkle snails. So what are marine snails? What do they look like? So this is a very close up picture of a marine snail if you've never seen them that close. Um, you can see the shell here and then they have a little eye spot, which is right here. And then they have a couple tentacles. So marine snails are mobile. So that means that they move around. Um, they don't zoom around in the intertidal, but they can get around in between pools and they're abundant grazers. So they really like to scrape diatoms or microalgae off of the rocks or munch on their favorite algae within the intertidal and really important prey for a lot of different species, including some humans. And so what do we know about marine snails and increasing temperature? Well, we know that snails are ectotherms. And so this means that their metabolism is closely tied to the water temperature that they're in. So if you look at this little figure here, this is showing you a little snail and this snail has a bunch of energy and that energy needs to get allocated to different processes like metabolism, to their growth, to their reproduction. And so if we add increasing or changing temperature to this equation, we could see a shift in the amount of energy needed to be allocated to things like metabolism. And so this can leave less energy to be allocated to things like growth and reproduction. And so increases in temperature can cause trade-offs between other demographic rates. So things like growth and reproduction. And when we look at marine snails and changing conditions, there's a lot of different relationships that go into this tiny little critter. So we have this little snail here and they have all their physiology that's going on. So things like their metabolism, how they build their shells, and that all translates into their demographic rates or things like growth, their reproduction, how well they survive. And then this is all under the blanket of increasing temperature and ocean acidification. And so these relationships are constantly changing and marine snails are really weird because they have an added extra layer of complexity where they can get parasites. So this figure here is showing you um, a little snail on a treadmill saying, oh, I'm out of shape, I need to lay off the trematodes because parasites can impact how well those demographic rates are functioning in marine snails. So let's talk about parasites and snails. Um, there are a lot of different steps for parasites to grow and reproduce. It's very complicated. Um, here's a general schematic of how that works. So on the left here in panel A, that's showing you uh, pretty much each step that trematodes have to go through in order for them to live and reproduce. The B panel here is showing you what happens in the snail. So this top part, that's what a snail looks like when it's out of its shell. Um, I was a little disturbed when I first saw this picture. Um, I didn't quite know how twisted their bodies were. Um, so you learn something new every day about your study species. 
But what this is showing you is it all starts off with a bird and then the bird poops and it leaves trematode eggs in its species. And then some poor little snail crawls over that poop and it gets infected with those eggs. And then the trematode parasites start hatching when they're inside of the snail and they start growing and they're moving throughout different regions within the snail and they're getting bigger and bigger. And once they reach a certain size, they then morph into a different um, life form, essentially, of the parasite called cesarea. So it's just like a different stage of the parasite. And then those are released from the snail. So these parasites aren't actually killing the snails. But then what happens is, is those cesarea are released into the water and they can swim on their own. And then they find a fish host. That fish then gets eaten by the bird and the cycle starts all over again. So lots of complicated relationships when we're talking about parasites and snails are just one stop for these trematode parasites in their life cycle. And in particular, this figure here is showing you the invasion threat of new trematode parasites may be reestablishing in areas that they were once gone from. And it's being predicted that maybe ch changing temperature is allowing for those parasites to extend their range or reestablish in areas where they were once um, gone from. And so Catalina is right about right in between here. So for invasion threat, it's kind of low, but it could also be high. So we don't really know um, how present these parasites are, especially on our west coast here in California. As we get up higher towards San Francisco, we can see that the invasion threat kind of seems to be on the lower end, but Southern California might be in areas where there's high invasion threat. Well, we already know, right, that temperature alone have a lot of different various costs on metabolism, reproduction, and growth for snails. So remembering our figure on this side, right? So now we're adding also parasitism. And parasites themselves can really impact their snail hosts. So they can cause damage to their digestive gland, how well they can digest food. They can slow the snail's growth, decrease reproduction, lower metabolic rate, and it can impact their grazing or how well they're able to eat and then digest those nutrients. So this figure here is showing you consumption rate, which is just how much the snail is eating and then two different water temperatures. So they were looking at uninfected and infected snails. And at the lower water temperature, those infected snails weren't eating very much. But then at the higher water temperature, we saw that then the infected snails were eating way more than the uninfected snails. So this is really showing us that there's also a complicated relationship when we're talking about parasites as well as um, snails and temperature. And it's not all doom and gloom. So um, parasites aren't going to take over the entire ocean. There's actually growing evidence suggesting that marine protected areas or MPAs can help increase ecosystem health. And so having increased biodiversity, so a bunch of different species present or overall abundance, how many species are actually present individuals of those species can actually help buffer against pathogens and parasites. And so there's a lot of different types of MPAs. There's no use zones where you know, no activities are permitted, all the way to multi-use zones where, you know, there's tourism, there's fishing, aquaculture, lots of things. In those areas, we tend to see less biodiversity and, and less abundance of individuals. But what we really need is just baseline data on parasite prevalence. Um, and we need this to help us better predict population responses to altered environmental conditions. We really don't know how prevalent marine parasites are. Um, in anywhere really within the oceans. We, people are starting to study this, but it's really kind of an unknown moving forward. So this brings me to my research at Catalina. So I actually went out to Catalina last month, um, last month and this month. So I just got back from, from Wrigley. Um, and so the figure on the left is showing you um, the island. And I was looking at different MPA sites. So I collected some snails from Bird Rock MPA and then Farnsworth Offshore MPA, which is where Little Harbor is located. And I was looking at one snail species, the eroded periwinkle snail or Litorhinochinae. And so they're really tiny little snails you can see here. So I went out to Catalina, I collected a bunch of snails. Um, I went out to Bird Rock, it's covered in a lot of bird poop, so it doesn't smell the best. But I collected a bunch of snails and I brought them back into the lab. 
here's a little video clip of one of my snails underneath the microscope. I was able to watch them move around. You can see their little tentacles and then their little um, foot moving. I kind of think it reminds me of like a little corgi butt. But I took all these snails and I looked at them underneath the microscope. So I call these my little snail condos. And each one was put inside these little petri dishes. And then I stressed them out a little bit with heat. And then that would cause the parasites to shed out of the snails. And then I could count them underneath the microscope, as you can see on that left picture there. But unfortunately, I didn't find any parasites. So I collected and surveyed about 400 snails. I didn't find a single parasite. So no parasites on Catalina. The snails seem to be very healthy. Um, and so I'm gonna potentially be investigating other areas on the mainland. And even though I didn't find any parasites on Catalina, that actually opens more questions of, you know, where are these parasite heavy locations? Are they on the mainland? Are they on other island chains? Um, and for right now, well, we're gonna keep looking and, and see where we end up in the future. So I wanna say thank you to the Wrigley staff and um, I'm open to any questions.